Everybody knows things are bad. Well, I'd give anything to get out of wars altogether. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. But which is the way back to Kansas? Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street. And there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. Follow the yellow brick road. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. Follow the yellow brick road? We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. I want you to get mad. Follow the yellow brick road. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Hey there, everybody. It is P.T. Pop with all four lobes of my brain securely bound behind my back. And welcome to P.T. Pop, A Mind Revolution where I lead you out of the rabbit hole one grain of truth at a time. Thank you for downloading me, and welcome to the year 2022. When I was a kid, they told us we'd be flying around in rocket ships in the year 2000. Well, it's 2022, and we still don't have any rocket ships to fly around in. Unless you're William Shatner, and you get to go up in, what was his name, Bezos? Bezos spaceship very exciting stuff you know that opening introduction there from the movie network is a favorite of mine it was recorded and filmed in the early 1970s and the same issues are coming up 50 years later (laughs) the Russians imagine the Russians are still our adversary they're still trying to sell us that the Russians are the adversary they're stealing our elections. They're manipulating our minds. They're flying overhead in invisible rocket ships. You know, all this crazy stuff they talk about with the Russians. But I am P.T. Pop, attempting to lead you out of the rabbit hole one grain of truth at a time. And i got to tell you, for those of you that haven't heard my podcast before, my podcast came to be a couple of years ago when my wife and I flew to Wyoming to go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, on vacation and do some photography and some touristy type things. And on our flight back out of Wyoming into Dallas, our flight leaving Dallas to Cleveland was canceled due to bad weather. And we were trapped in the Dallas airport overnight. We had to sleep on the floor. And while I'm laying on the floor with thousands of other people using my coat as a pillow, using my backpack as a pillow, my coat as a blanket, my wife doing the same thing. I was struck with the unfeeling way the the airport and the airline treated us when our flight was canceled. And it's, it was amazing to me at the time how this major corporation who must deal with airline delays and flight delays all the time, had absolutely no plan of action for any of us. There were no hotels in the area. There was no place for us to sleep. There was no food for us to eat. All we had was, you know, vending machine food and sleep on the floor underneath the seats, those horrible metal seats. And as I sat there laying on the floor, staring at the fluorescent lights in the ceiling of this airport in the concourse of, I think it was Gate C in the Dallas airport for whatever airline we were flying, I became enraged. 
quietly enraged because I know these days you can't say anything out of out of the ordinary in an airline or an airport or lower rescue. Have the Secret Service and Homeland Security come swooping in and handcuff you and take you to a windowless room somewhere and beat you with rubber hoses. So I laid there in anger that this major multi multi billion dollar company has no plan of action when there are flight delays. They didn't offer us anything more than a flimsy blanket. No pillows, no food, nothing. If memory serves me right, they came through with a cart of Cheetos and Doritos and chips and crackers and stuff, and that was about it. They didn't have anything other than that. They didn't apologize. They didn't have a room for us to sleep in. They didn't have any place for us to go. And it was then that it occurred to me these corporations truly don't care about any of us. And the corporations in the world are designed and they're in place to make whoever owns the corporation make them billionaires, make them lots of money. At the sacrifice of the common person, me and you. They put us in these tin cans with a couple of engines under each wing. And on a wing and a prayer, they fly us from one part of the country to the other, hoping the plane doesn't crash. It lands and they put us in another steel tin can. There's just a tunnel to get us from from one plane to the next or from one gate to the next or to get us from one tunnel that goes from the plane to the baggage then to a taxi to home. If you've noticed, as everybody's noticed, now I haven't been to airports in any place other than the United States, but all the airports I've visited here in the U.S. are as uncomfortable as hell. They're, they're horrible places. The seats are metal with a fine, thin foam padding and fake vinyl covering over it, steel arms. You can't lay on the, the chairs. They set up the armrests in these chairs so you can't lay down. They're not designed for your comfort. They're designed to give you just enough comfort to sit for about an hour in between flights. But your ass goes numb. Your ass gets itchy. Many of the airports don't even have charging stations for your electronic devices that everybody has these days. In a Dallas airport, the men's room in the terminal we were in was overflowing with urine. The, the urinals were blocked. The floor was covered with urine. And all they did was put up a sign saying, Caution, floor, wet floor ahead. And, and I was enraged. You know, we couldn't sleep. You're trying to sleep in a concourse where the lights are all br- brightly lit. There's people all over the place upset, kids crying. There's no food to eat. It's an impossible environment to sleep in. If you want to drink anything, you, you've got to go to the local bar in, in the concourse and drink watered-down drinks. You'd probably have to have five drinks. Like if you wanted a rum and coke, you'd probably have to drink five just to get the buzz of what you would get from one shot of rum and coke out of the bottle or rum, rum out of the bottle. And this is where I got this idea to start this podcast to try to inform people of how these corporations do not care about you and they do not care about me. There's only one thing they care about, is making money and making sure they don't get sued. Because lawsuits mean they lose money. And I've got to tell you, you know, as I've said, I'm nobody. I don't have a fancy Ivy League school degree. I don't have a degree psychology or sociology. I don't have a doctorate from any place. I'm just a schmuck with a bachelor's degree in communications from Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, who happens to think that people need to wake up. People need to start waking up to how they're completely tricked and manipulated. And the most shocking thing that I've found out about my podcast is that I found that people don't want to be awaken. They don't want to be awoken. They don't want to be bothered with that. I've known this for a long time though. When I was a kid, when I was a little kid, my dad, well, both my parents were alcoholics, but my dad was a severe, severe alcoholic. When I was real little, six, seven, eight, nine years old, I thought I could kind of rationalize with him and, and, and talk to him. 
And I thought if I threw enough words at the man, if I could kind of word it in different ways, he would go, oh, you're right, Pete. Maybe I should stop drinking. That's a good point you brought up there, Pete. I guess I am going to start stop drinking because you told me that it's killing my body and it's making us sad and we don't have any money. Oh, we don't have any money? Oh, you know, I thought maybe if I rationalized with him and talked to him. Now, this is the mind of a seven or eight year old thinking that I could, could, could negotiate sobriety with my father. I thought if I threw enough words at him, he would start to think that common sense would sink into his brain. And he'd go, oh, maybe I should stop drinking. Maybe my son Peter's got a good idea. Well, that didn't work. What I discovered was words just bounced off of him. It was as if I was shooting a BB gun at a tank. My words just bounced right off of him. He didn't even didn't even listen, and and he didn't listen to anyone. It wasn't just me. We we were all pleading with him to get sober. We pleaded with my mother to get sober. My mother finally did get sober in 1975, if not earlier, but. Um, I remember it being 1975. But my dad, as far as I know, never stopped drinking, and no one could convince him to do anything to do otherwise. And that's what I'm finding out with people here in the United States. I, I, cannot, I cannot speak for people in other countries because the only other country I've been to is Canada. And I'm finding out that no matter how I word things or how I say it or how I dance around. Most people don't, if they don't want to be awoken, they're not going to be awoken. And why don't they want to be awoken? Because when when you're awoken, and I'm talking about woke, like the term woke is a political term these days. They've taken that term and they've politicized it so people don't really know what it means. You know, people have no clue what being woke means. But most people... To me, when I say woke, I'm not using it as a right-wing or a left-wing word. When I pull it up here on Google, woke. Alert to injustice in society, especially racism. We need to stay angry and stay woke. This is this is the dictionary in, in Google. Now, I don't know what woke has to do with racism. And now when I look over here into Wikipedia, it says woke is an English adjective meaning alert to racial prejudice and discrimination that originated in African American vernacular English. I don't know. I don't know how this word got attached to uh, racism, but they politicized the word. And to me, the word "woke" means what the first part of the definition says: says alert to injustice in in society. Alert to injustice in in society. And that's what I mean it to mean. I, um, my word woke has nothing to do with race or sex or religion. It's non-political. I'm not affiliated with any political organizations. I'm not affiliated with any religious groups. I'm an independent critic of society. I'm what I call a social critic. And I am woke because I woke up one day and I saw the, in, the injustices and I saw the inequities and the mistreatment of humans around the world by corporate America, by the corporate world, not just corporate America, but the corporate world in general. And many of you say, many have said to me, well, people, just cool your jets, just relax, just relax a little bit. Why are you getting so upset? You know, so so we, we like to drive our Teslas. We, we like to smoke our camels. We like to drink our Jack Daniels. So what? We like to look at our pornography. What business is that of yours? Well, the problem comes into play is is if you don't know the tricks of the trade and the tricks of the corporate world, you don't know how you're being manipulated by all the companies that you invest your money in. I'm not talking about investments like stocks and bonds and mutual funds. I'm talking about taking your hard-earned dollars, plopping it on the counter to buy whatever widget, whatever product you want to buy, whether it's cigarettes or chewing gum or maple syrup or whatever it happens to be. These corporations are evil. They're deceptive and they're sadistic and they do not care about you or your well-being in any way, shape, or form. 
And that's what I discovered when I was in the concourse at Dallas, in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, waiting for my flight for the next day once the storm passed. I realized that the company that flew me from Wyoming to Dallas didn't give a shit about me. They just they sit there with their fingers crossed hoping the plane doesn't crash so they don't get sued and go out of business. They're hoping nobody gets angry and upset or hurt in the airport while they're sleeping there overnight. But wouldn't you think if these these companies really cared about us as travelers, these these airlines, that they would have maybe a large gymnasium built onto the wing of the airport to house people for overnight stays, maybe something with little tents that we could sleep in or some type of food vendor that would be called in at night, somebody that's on call for for storms, some place for the kids to go. But there's nothing. There's nothing for the kids. There's nothing for the adults. There's no food. There's nowhere to sleep. Don't don't any of you see how they just don't give a shit about you at all? They don't care about you. It's all about the bottom dollar. It's all about the bottom line, making money off of you. Because they know you're a bunch of saps. They know you're easily led. And they, you're easily manipulated. And, and you know, as I sit here shrouded in the darkness of my studio... My head is filled with so many questions. And the biggest one is, why can't people see that each and every day of their lives, they're lied to and misled and cheated by these corporations? Why can't anybody see it? And I've come to the conclusion that it's just too painful. And in other of my podcasts, I've talked about how I've come to this position of, quote, being woke, unquote, And I do not mean this about racism. This is about alert to injustices in our society. And when I originally stumbled upon this, and when I finally was solidified, was 9-11, was around 2007 or 8 when I saw a movie called Loose Change that questioned the original story behind 9-11. And it opened my eyes and I realized that our own government had lied to us about 9-11 just so they could move their military, just so they could move our military into Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria, unabated, unhindered, not bothered by any other military, without the approval of the American people, without the approval of Congress, without an act of war. We just picked up all of our little toy soldiers and we plopped them anywhere we wanted. And for what reason, I don't know, probably something to do with oil, something to do with lithium mines, something to do with control, having a military stage in certain places. And when I realized this, it was painful. When I, when I realized that our own government that I had believed in wholeheartedly up until that very moment in my life in 2007, it was like it hit in the stomach by a prize fighter, like a heavyweight champion had just giving me a good body blow to the gut. Knocked the wind out of me. And I'll tell you this, when you realize your own government has lied to you, after all these years of believing in it, you go, oh no, we're fucked. Oh no, it's bad. And it hurts. It hurts a lot. And it it really sends you reeling. Sends you for a loop. You're, You're lost for a while. I was totally... Totally blown away by this discovery. And I was dizzied. I was dizzied by it and I was nauseous and I was confused and I didn't know where to go. And that's why I think most people, most of you out there who are starting to find out the truth, you're finding out this is painful and you're going to have to figure out how to deal with it. Because it is not easy when you realize that the corporations run everything. The corporations have bought and paid for every politician that's in, in our economy, that's in our government. The corporations have bought and paid for health directors and police officers and actors and movie companies. 
because there's agendas and political agendas that are pushing that they want they want push forward. There's land that they want. There's possessions that they need. There's things they need to get control of. And whoever has the most money wins usually. But I found that most people don't want to know this because it hurts too much to know this. Like I've said in other places, you know, I'm not like your typical podcaster on here. I am not. I'm not like Dan Bongino, former Secret Service agent, former New York City cop, who's just now a rabble rouser for the right-wing agenda on Fox. He goes on there and tells you all these horrifying, scary things about Fauci and about Geraldo Rivera and all these other people, but he never gives you a solution. You ever notice that? He never gives you a solution. And he's one of many talking heads, both famous and infamous, and people that aren't that popular, they have podcasts, but, but have a name out there, whether it's Bongino or whoever it is. I just pull him out because I watch him, and he has, he speaks with such intensity. Did you hear what Fauci said today? Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, you know. But he never has a solution to it. I don't have a book to sell you. I've never been on Oprah. I've never been on Dr. Phil. I've never been on Dr. Phil, you know. Never been anywhere like that. I'm not here trying to tell you something just for the sake of telling you something. I'm trying to get people to think. And, you know, it's getting to be... It's, it's getting to be goddamn ridiculous. It is. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. And this leads me to a book I found. A wonderful book, not wonderful book. Make it sounds like it's sappy or syrupy, saccharine seed, but a, a great book I found just just the other day, and it discusses a topic called neuro marketing. And what I want to talk about today is how you're manipulated by these corporations while you're in the womb. Believe it or not, companies are manipulating each and every one of us before we're even born. Now, neuromarketing is a process of studying the consumer behavior of application of various tools. It is a technique that probes deep into the non-conscious actions performed by a consumer and how these reactions influence the buying behavior. And that's from Relevance.com. Companies use consumer psychologists. These, these major multi-billion dollar companies have psychologists they keep on staff to analyze consumer activities, consumer buying habits. So they know how to market their products, so they know how to so they know how to manipulate you. So you'll buy more and more and more and more of their of their of their products, whether you need them or not. And there's twelve ways in which corporations are secretly manipulating your emotions. Now, f for instance, they use subliminal messaging. If you look at Heineken, pull up the Heineken logo. There's actually three smiley faces in Heineken in the, in the graphic design, in the font that they use. The E's are tilted in such a way so they look like little smiley faces. Amazon has a smiley face right there in your face. Then they put these in there so you feel happier about their brands. Um, cereal products. Now, th this article is from Huffington Post. And I'm quoting um, information from an article written by Kevin Short. October 9, 2014 in the Huffington Post. And he's discovered that cereals and other brands use human-like mascots to make you feel like you know the product. Frosted Flakes is Tony the Tiger. Lucky Charms is Lucky Charms Leprechaun. And he goes on, uh, similarity characters on cereal boxes gaze downward to make eye contact with children. Now, if you look at the box of tricks... They've got the white rabbit that I've I've known about the white rabbit and tricks since I was 
I've seen this rabbit since I was at least three years old. And I remember when I was real little, I really wanted tricks. I wanted tricks so bad just because of the commercial, this bouncy rabbit. And and if you look at the box of tricks, the eye gaze in some of the boxes is looking down. It looks down because kids are small and they're looking up at the cereal box. But they did a study where they changed the gaze, where the gaze of the rabbit actually looks out at the viewer of the box. And the viewers said they felt more, even more drawn to the product because the rabbit was looking into their eyes. And they do this. They do this with their products to draw you in, to draw your kids in. International House of Pancakes, now today known as IHOP, redesigned as many to make, make, you, uh, to, uh, make it more appealing and easier to read. Um, Bloomingdale's and, and many other stores use certain smells to entice you inside the store, like the smell of cinnamon. Supermarkets put fruits and vegetables up front to coax you into buying junk food later. So every grocery store I've ever been in, when you walk in, the first department is always produce. It's always produce. You always walk into a shelves and shelves of apples and pears and peaches and carrots, oh my, pears and apples and carrots, peaches, oh my. They're as far as the eye can see, lettuce and tomatoes and everything. And this study found that they do this because when you you're in the store later and you're you're in the aisle of potato chips and candy bars, you don't feel so guilty because you've already bought your produce for the day, and you you don't feel quite as anxious. It's designed that way so you enter the store feeling good about the healthy purchases, and don't feel as bad buying all those cookies, chips, and bottles of soda later in the store. J C Penney's this is number seven. J C Penney's jacked up prices. So that it seemed like customers were getting a big sale discount. So if you had if you had a pair of pants that were traditionally thirty bucks, they jack them up to forty five, and then give you a discount of fifteen dollars to make it seem like you're saving money when actually the original price of the pants were thirty dollars. Um, number eight, Apple. I always wondered this about Apple. Apple will waits to send you receipts from iTunes or what's now called Apple Music, download so that you don't feel bad about your impulse impulse buy. So I've done this. I'll go out and I'll buy a, I just bought a, a whole album by Tom Petty, Wildflowers by Tom Petty off of Apple. And I was freaking out because I didn't see that the purchase went through. I didn't get the receipt. And I'm like, where the hell's my receipt? My receipt didn't come. Did I make the purchase? And there's no one to call on Apple to make sure it went through. And then it hit my card. So I knew it went through, so I, I relaxed. But I didn't get the, the receipt until a few hours later. And what this does is this is delays the guilt. Apple reduces that guilt by simply delaying sending you receipts for iTunes or App Store purchases by a couple of hours or days. That's according to Wired, wired.com. Number nine, bars and restaurants won't include the dollar sign on their menus, so you'll forget your spending. They will exclude the dollar sign so you don't feel like you're spending. And that's that's brilliant, but you know it takes a lot of psychology. They must have done a lot of study to figure that out. Number 10, stores will hook you by letting you touch things before you buy. I'm not going to go into that one because I, I don't I've never really experienced that. Stores will play slow music. These are department stores. Will play slow music to get you to linger inside, and form emotional attachments with brands. Now, this this is where I got into Martin Lindstrom. Martin Lindstrom wrote a book that I just bought, and part of my topic today is Martin Lindstrom's book, Brandwashed. And it's called Brand Wash Tricks Companies Use to Manipulate Our Minds and Persuade Us to Buy. According to Mr. Lindstrom, the women said that music, malls music, music in malls, the Muzak, continued to have a calming effect on their children even after they were born. So what they did is they did a study in this book by Mr. L- um, Lindstrom where the pregnant mothers went into a store that was playing a certain type of calming music 
And the mothers loved it. It, came, it brought them peace and serenity and stuff like that. Lady, a few months later, has her baby. Takes the baby back to the same store in their stroller. Baby's crying out in the hallway of the mall. Once they cross the threshold of the store, it's playing the same music that the mother heard a few months before. All of a sudden, the baby becomes quiet and docile and passive. And the study concluded that the baby is reading two things. The baby can read the energy level of the mother at the moment. The mother hears the music, but also they found out through intensive study that the baby could hear the music through the walls of the womb. And it had a calming effect on them at the time. And they had a residual you know, a residual effect from it. They remembered it from being in utero. And it's carried on into their actual life. This is how they start to manipulate you at a very young age. And in this book, Brandwashed by Mr. Lindstrom, I'm reading this book with such... I'm fascinated with this book because they discuss some things in here that I didn't know. I had no idea you manipulated as as a kid inside the uterus of your mother. And in one comment here, uh, Mr. Lindstrom writes, brand preferences are set in stone even before that. By the age of four or five, in fact, Based on some new research of Uncovered, he says, I'd even go far to suggest that some of the cleverest manufacturers in the world are at work trying to manipulate our taste preferences even earlier, like before we're even born. Now this is a quote taken after a study of a coffee company, I think in Brazil or South America somewhere, where they gave mothers candies, uh, pregnant mothers, these coffee-flavored candies. And after their babies were born, and the mothers gave their their kids these candies, the, the children became very placid and passive when they had these candies, and they were really into the, they just loved this candy. Um... Scientists, he says, have known for years that maternal speech is audible in utero. In other words, a fetus can actually hear the mother's voice from inside the womb. Developing fetus can hear a a far broader range of tones that come from outside the mother's body as well. Not only can soon-to-be babies hear music from inside the womb, but the music they hear leaves a powerful and lasting impression that can actually shape their adult tastes. I didn't know any of this. I had no idea. So they did this study. I'm not going to quote it verbatim, but say, for instance, the mother listens to the Rolling Stones. And it makes her happy. And she listens to the stones while she's got the baby inside of her. And she is dancing around, listening to the stones. The baby's born. And they discover that any time that the mother's listening to Rolling Stones music, the baby gets happy. And there, it's a, their study and their belief that, that the baby was indoctrinated to this music while it was in utero. So it's so. They have also discovered that there's evidence to indicate that hearing tunes and jingles in the womb favorably disposes us to those jingles and possibly the brands with which they are associated. In other words, he he summarizes here, uh, summarizes the minute we're born. We may already be biologically programmed to like the sounds and music we were exposed to in utero. And it's not just sounds. It's it's food, too. It 
And this book is fascinating because I'm only about 30 pages into it. But these corporations, my point is these corporations have started to manipulate the population starting with babies, starting with fetuses that haven't even become babies yet by playing certain music in stores that sell maturity clothes, by selling, playing certain music and having certain smells in certain stores where pregnant mothers are, are they frequent. It's very, very well thought out and planned. And it's maniacal because what it does is it predisposes the child to like certain products, to like certain flavors. If the mother is sitting in a coffee shop listening to calm music and drinking a certain flavored latte, that flavor goes into the womb. And you find out years later that the baby likes that same type of coffee. And people say, well, that's just genetic you know, they're finding out through these studies in this book that it's it's tricky manipulation of the environment of you know where these women shop. And baby shoppers there's some indi- indicates that these shopping mall experiments have a potent effect on the shopping habits of the next generation for years to come. I mean, it affects your food, it affects what kind of music you listen to, it affects how you shop and where you shop. It says here, but what many pregnant women don't know is that what they consume doesn't just affect the baby's development while it's in the womb. It actually influences the baby's adult habits. So the things you don't know, the things you just think are innocuous or simple or harmless while you're shopping as a mother. You don't know you're being manipulated. You're being manipulated and they're intentionally trying to manipulate your baby so they can have future consumers that want to come in and want to buy that. I'm just using coffee for for an example. But they're basically trying to manipulate children in the womb so they can have future customers I'm trying to simplify this, and I'm using coffee. Coffee is probably a bad example because you don't think of babies drinking coffee. But but they're intentionally marketing to the womb through the mother by music and smells and tastes because they've done studies to find out that the baby not only can hear, it can feel things, taste things, smell things through the mother. Fascinating. It's fascinating and it's scary. It's horrifying at the same time. It says here that it's been found that when mothers smoke during pregnancy, which my mother did, I'm sure she did, their children are more likely to become smokers by the age of 22. I didn't, I've never smoked. I thought smoking was disgusting and I've never touched a cigarette. Um, it, it says, he states here, Mr. Lindstrom states, there's real biological credence for this. It's been found that the strongest tastes and aromas like garlic, pass through the mother's amniotic fluid and are actually tasted by the fetus. <laughs> Guys, I mean, I know I'm nobody. I, you know, I get maybe 30, 40 downloads per podcast. And what I'm trying to do, instead of being like a Bongino saying, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, I'm trying to educate you how you're manipulated by these corporations on a daily basis so you're aware of them, so you can walk away, so you have more control. Now, that's easier said than done, I realize that, because this Mr. Lindstrom who wrote this book, he is um, a well-respected person who's worked in marketing for some of the biggest firms in the world, I think including Burger King and a few other places like Starbucks. So he knows the tricks that all these companies play on the consumer. And this man at the beginning of his book, says, I tried to fast from any consumer-type products with a major name attached to it. He tried to eat apples, you know, just regular old apples instead of candy bars. He tried to just drink tap water instead of, you know, um, fancy water out of a bottle, things like that. And he 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 did great. He said for like six months he was to- totally abstained from anything corporate, corporate food, corporate clothes, corporate anything. Everything was just very generic and plain. 
and then he finally caved in after six months. He said it's it's extremely hard to pull away from all these corporate corporate influences. And I I have been preaching abstinence to each of you who listen to this to try to abstain from Facebook and Instagram and Twitter because you're being manipulated there. Your data is being farmed. Your information is being sold. They're manipulating you at every click of the mouse. They're manipulating you on every tab of the browser. They're selling to you constantly. And the Mr. Lindstrom states here, the full range of psychological tricks and schemes companies and their shrewd marketers and advertisers have and concocted to prey on our most deeply rooted fears, dreams, and desires, all in the service of persuading us to buy their brands and products. And I could go on and on about this, but I just want to touch off on how how you're manipulated at a very young age in utero. It starts there. It starts there. Many of your tastes and your interests begin in utero. And it's a tightrope. Each and every one of us are walking a tightrope. You know, and in one wrong step, you're going to get hooked on something. Because the world is run by the corporations. It's not run by the government. You know, our government is run by the corporations. It's very fascist. And I'm not political, but I I truly believe that, that our president really is a figurehead run by the corporations. The corporations say, push this, this, and this. We want this agenda. We want this oil field. We want this lithium mine. Put the military over here so we have control of the lithium to bring down the cost of lithium for us to mine it so we, we can sell iPhones or we can sell iPads or we can sell Teslas, Tesla cars. And it's a very it's a very rough road to walk if you try to get away from all of it because you're surrounded by it. You're constantly being bombarded by marketing. I mean, we're all walking billboards for some company. I mean, whether it's LL Bean on our shirts or Nike or Reebok on our shoes or Lee Lee jeans or you know on our hip pocket of our jeans, everything is a billboard now. You can't get away from it. There's no escaping the marketing. Companies, and Mr. Lindstrom states here, companies have figured out how to physically and psychologically addict us to their products and how certain popular websites are actually rewiring our brains to hook us on the act of shopping and buying. I think about Amazon. Amazon and Etsy. For me, I was addicted to Etsy for a little while. I was buying junk off of Etsy, Etsy and until I ran into a... a um, a company in Pakistan. I bought a jacket from a company in Pakistan, and it showed up, and it wasn't what I ordered. And I didn't know the company was in Pakistan until I tried to return the product, and I tried to raise, file a complaint against the company, and the company said, "Well, just return us the product." Well, I went back to FedEx, went right to their their big warehouse store here in Cleveland, laid at the counter, said, "Well, it cost you four hundred dollars to mail it back." I said, four hundred dollars." I said, why? She goes, because it's in Pakistan. And they're considered like a terrorist country, and you you need like a, I don't know what she said, a shipping visa or some type of clearance to, to mail stuff to Pakistan. I'm like, oh, I said, oh, fuck, forget it. She's like, I know. I, she said she sees this all the time. And that's when I stopped. I canceled my Etsy account. And then on Amazon, I just buy stuff. And I'm constantly researching products for, for the studio here, new microphones, you know, new musical instruments, new computers, because I'm constantly trying to figure out better ways to make these podcasts and make better ways to make my YouTube videos and things like that. But um, what I'm finding is that it's really hard to pull away from these companies. And when I mention how they figured out a way to, to manipulate you, I think Amazon has done it. I'm like, heck, if I don't have to walk into a store, if I don't have to leave the comfort of my house, get in my car, drive down the street, deal with the idiot drivers, then have to risk my life walking through the parking lot while some idiot tries to run me over because they're texting on their phone and not paying attention to driving. Then get into the store and get bumped into and get sneezed on and coughed on by a bunch of snot-nosed little kids and crabby mothers. 
if I can alleviate my stress of having to go through the checkout and stand in line like an idiot and deal with the snot-nosed teenager at the at the checkout line, yes, yes, Amazon is my king. And I will buy everything from Amazon. Because I'm, I'm not a real popular, I'm not real happy with what I experience when I go out in the real world. I've become somewhat reclusive. And honestly, some of you might say, well, you're, you're a bit nuts there, Pete. You're reclusive? Well, he's reclusive, everybody. No, no, I'm much happier on having to deal with everybody. Because the world, in case you haven't noticed, has gotten a little bit, just a tiny bit stupid and crazy. Oh, my. It says here by Mr. Lindstrom in his book, studies have shown that the majority of our brand and product preferences, and in some cases values they represent, are pretty firmly embedded in us by the age of seven. I think the first seven years of your life are the most formative years of any hum, of, of, of the human being. He states, our brand preferences are set in stone even before that, by the age of four or five. In fact, based on some new research he'd encountered, he'd even go so far to suggest that some of the cleverest manufacturers in the world are trying to manipulate our taste preferences trying to manipulate our taste preferences even earlier, much earlier, like before we're even born. I stated that before. Scientists have known for years that maternal speech is audible in utero. In other words, a fetus can actually hear the mother's voice from inside the womb. And I've stated some of this. It means you're very, you're in a very vulnerable state as a fetus. You don't have any escape from it. If your mother's sitting in the house listening to Metallica and smoking Marlboro Reds, there's a good chance if you survive being inside of a toxic environment like that and you're born, you're eventually going to start smoking your smoking Marlboro Reds and you're going to be listening to Metallica. <laughs> Crazy, man. So there's no, really no escape from it. They've got us from the moment we're, we're conceived. And... As I stated, I don't want to be a rabble I don't want to say the sky is falling. I'm trying to inform you so you know. Because knowledge is power. And if you know who, what, when, where, and why, you'll know who to avoid and how to have more control of your life. When I walk into a store now, I realize where the food is located. I realize where the impulse buys are. Impulse buys are little candies and treats that they put at the checkout counter in every store in this country because they think you're anxious, you're hungry, it's the end of the day, you're standing in line waiting for the snot-nosed teenager to check you out. Oh, maybe to compensate and make myself feel good, a little, um, a little burst of endorphins, I'll buy this pack of M&Ms or I'll get these cheese cheese crackers. I do it all the time. Oh, those cheese crackers look good to me. It's almost I love the cheese crackers. They come in packets of six with the orange crackers and the peanut butter in between them or the cheese in between the crackers. I'm a sucker for those. I'm a sucker for pizza and cheese crackers. If, if, pre, if President Russian President Putin tied me to a chair and said, give me all your country's secrets or die, I'd say, hold on, you don't have to kill me. Just give me some pizza and give me some cheese crackers. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. That and a woman in some leather pants and thigh-high boots, and I'm yours, hon. Mr. Putin, I'm your bitch. But, you know, I, I'm aware of this stuff now, and it gives you more control. It makes, you, it makes it easier to walk away. It's not going to be easy to walk away, but it's easier to go, you know what, I didn't know that's why the produce was in the front. And so when you get to the chip aisle, you're like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't buy those chips. This is all a way to get me to buy the chips, to get me to feel good about buying the chips. I didn't know that. So I want you, not for my benefit, I, you know, what do I gain from this? I'm not making any money from this. So far, since I moved my podcast over to Anchor.fm, I've made $2. $2 in monetization from, from my little advertisements I make for Anchor. 
and I haven't even realized it yet. I've never cashed out the account. I mean, what am I going to do with two dollars? I can't even put a gallon of gas in my car for that. Um, be aware of how you're being manipulated. Be aware of your children and how they're being manipulated. It's a continuous thing. It's everywhere. And what I'm going to do in my next coming, I'm going to do like little 40 segment, um, 40 minute segments on this book, Brandwashed by Mr. Lindstrom. And this first part was about how you manipulated in utero. And trust me, from what I've read, it gets worse after that. <laughs> it gets way worse. And I appreciate everybody who listens to my podcast. Thanks for downloading me. If you like this, tell your friends about it. And everybody, I hope you have a great new year. It's 2022. Maybe this new year will be a better one than the last two. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. You're listening to Crazy Talk on a Mind Revolution. Please, if you're out of the rabbit hole, the mother of the roof, up on the roof, looking for something, but there's no proof at all.